I'm one of the nurses in the Center for Reproductive Medicine, or new name, Center for Infertility and Reproductive Surgery. And this is IVF class. IVF is a process by where we're going to overstimulate your ovaries to make many more eggs than they usually make. We're going to take them out, put them in a dish, add sperm, and then some will fertilize, and then we're going to determine how many will go back into you. There's kind of a downward progression in IVF whereby we start with a lot of eggs. When we put the sperm in with them, only an, on average about half will fertilize. So about half of your eggs will have sperm get into them. So we don't end up with as many as we started with. The IVF process is two months long or two periods long. So I know that these two classes today are very overwhelming with a lot of information. The takeaway from this today that I absolutely need you to remember is call your nurse when you get your period. That's all you need to know, and then we'll talk you through the rest of it. There are several ways to do IVF and do the medications, do the first month. The first month is a way of calming down your own hormones. So when you get your next period and we're starting the stimulation medicine, we're not fighting against your own natural hormones. So we've calmed them right down. So I am going to give you some scenarios on the board of how this works. You all have a slightly different protocol based on several things your doctor's preference, your age. If you've done IVF somewhere else before, we may try to change it up a little to try something different on you. You may have male factor infertility that involves some other testing. So you're going to follow through with your instruction sheets that your nurses have put in your booklet for you. Okay? You're not going to remember all of these, but just know that sometimes if one protocol doesn't work, we may try a different one the next time. So you'll say, yeah, I remember something about that. And we'll re-educate you when that happens. So again, you're going to call when you get your period. Some of you will use barrier contraception. That means the use of condoms and no unprotected intercourse because on day 21 of your cycle, we're going to check a progesterone blood test to see if you've ovulated. And if you have, the next day, we'll start your calm down medicine called Lupron. Barbara may have told you in the first class that Lupron was initially manufactured and tested to treat prostate cancer in males. Many medications are not tested in women because we have a menstrual cycle that kind of skews the results. So lots of medications are only tested in men. And because it didn't go through the testing process in women, we don't know what it would do if you got spontaneously pregnant, which you're all sitting here in IVF class and laughing because you're here, but it does happen. So no unprotected intercourse. This is slow acting. You need to be on this about 10 days. And then you're going to get your next period. And the day after, you'll come in for some baseline blood tests and an ultrasound. And then you'll start your stimulation medicines. OK? In this time frame, one of the things that we would do if you have not already have it, had it done is a mock transfer. Mock means pretend. We don't have anything to transfer into you at this point. But when we do, we want to be able to do it smoothly, easily, and without any trauma to your embryos. So we're going to measure your uterus ahead of time. If you've recently had an office hysteroscopy, you probably got measured and you didn't even know it. But basically, it's putting a small, skinny, flexible catheter through your cervix 
when it hits the back wall of your uterus, this catheter has lines on it, so we know how deep you are. We know if you need to go a little left, a little right, a little up, a little down, or if we actually have trouble getting the catheter through your cervix. And then there are some other things we can do to help that. Okay? You may have a sheet in your booklet from your nurse who has given you a list of things that you need to get done. If that's checked off, a mock transfer, you're going to call the office when you get this period to schedule it. It's done between days 5 through 12. All right, another group of you on day 10 of your cycle. You're going to start using a urine ovulation predictor kit. You may have used those in the past. Um, in the Northeast, it's very dark in the morning times, and the kits that have a pink line are sometimes very difficult to see because it may be very, very light. So I suggest you get a kit that colors blue. Uh, first response is one of those. Clear Blue Easy is another one, and I want to caution you on the Clear Blue Easy. It used to be that they had the kit where you would pee on the stick each morning and you'd see nothing and the next day nothing and then one day a smiley face would come up and that was the day of your surge. Now they've changed it to be a four day window where there's something you see at one point and the next day there's something flashing and the day after that there's a couple of things flashing. It's a little confusing to our patients. I've actually had a conversation with the company and they concede that this is not a good kit for infertility patients. So if you can get the old clear blue easy that does not say four day window on it. All right. You're going to call us and let us know when you have your positive surge, the blue line, the smiley face, whatever it's going to be on your particular kit. And 10 days later, you're going to start an estrogen patch. It may be called Plimera or it may be called estrogen patch. The day after that, your calm down medicine, different from the other protocol. By the way, when we have a choice of two medicines, these are made by different companies, but they are exactly the same. Your insurance tells us which one we can use for you because they, um, they have a deal with the companies every year and which one that they get a special rate on. So you'll do three days of this calm down stuff. It's injectable. And then pretty soon you'll get a period. You'll come in the next day for just an ultrasound and then we'll start your stim meds. Okay? Another group of you on an oral contraceptive pill, birth control pill, not for the purpose of contraception, for the purpose of regulating your cycle, for the purpose of being able to take you off the pill at a short time. Most birth, con not most, all birth control pills are three weeks of an active drug and the seven pills at the bottom of the pack which are a different color are sugar pills, placebos. So don't take any of those, just take the active ones. Most likely we will not have you on for 21 days. We'll have you on for a shorter amount of time. When you come off the pill, you're going to get a period and then some of you will come in the next day for an ultrasound and start your meds. Another group of you will begin diluted Lupron. Same stuff as that, but the pharmacy has made it weaker. We don't want to over suppress you. We want to just do it a little bit so you don't ovulate, but not too much. We don't want to hold you back too much. So you'll start diluted Lupron the evening that you get your period. You'll do it the next day and come in for an ultrasound and then you'll start your meds. I want you to notice 
There's a period here and the next day an ultrasound. A period and an ultrasound. Period and ultrasound. It means that when you come in for your ultrasound, you're bleeding. It is a transvaginal ultrasound. That means in the ultrasound department, you'll be up in stirrups. They will hand you the probe and you will insert that into your vagina. Tell them when you're ready. And then they'll manipulate the outer, thank you. They'll manipulate the outer portion of that to be able to see your ovaries. So please bring your own equipment with you, tampons, pads, whatever you use, because they don't have anything down there for you. There are, during the week, lots of technicians. Some are men, some are women. If you feel strongly during the week that you want to be seen by a female technician, please ask for one. You just may need to wait a few minutes until one is available, but you may ask for one. On the weekends, however, if you have to do your baseline testing or any of your other testing on weekends, they have only two technicians. And it's the luck of the draw whether it happens to be two males that day or two females or one of each. So I'm just giving you that as a heads up warning. The day we start your ultrasound, we're going to, call, excuse me, the day we start your stimulation medicine, we're going to call day two of your cycle. But please know, it may not really be the second day of your period. All right? These folks, for instance, when we take them off the pill, have to come in by the fourth day, whether or not they've started a period. So they may start their stimulation medicine, but their period comes a few days later. So everybody on the first day of their stimulation medicine is called day two. You're going to come back on day seven, so we give you about five days of medicine. And when you come back, you'll be here for just an estradiol blood test. You don't need an ultrasound then. You really haven't been making much follicles at the time. The blood test will determine when we're going to see you the next time. And it's at that point that it's really important for you to be available and to be here because that time at which you're starting your stimulation medicines and you've gotten to day seven, that's the real intensive part of all of your testing. So if you have a vacation that's already scheduled, if you have a work trip that you have to take, if your partner is going to be out of town for any business, or if you're in somebody's wedding and you know that you have to be there for that, when you get this period, run these dates by your nurse and we can kind of count out to see if it'll interfere or if it's no problem at all. All right? Because when you're on the stimulation medicine, it's extremely important that we monitor how they're working on you. So let me just draw you a little picture here. Is that right? 19 and 18 is 37? Okay. All right. They are times, but they're not multiplied. It's a 20 by 20. 19 by 18. So when you're in ultrasound and they are measuring your follicles, we call them follicles, that's the place where the eggs grow. Ultrasound calls them cysts. And to us women, a cyst is something that shouldn't be there. Uh, so that's why we call them follicles, because that's what we're looking for. We can't see your eggs on an ultrasound or with a naked eye. So we have to go by the size of the follicle that they're growing in. They measure left to right and top to bottom, which is why we get the two numbers. What we're looking for 
is your estradiol blood level to be a, s a certain number, height. So let's say this person is about 2,500. And this person has 10 follicles on the right side and 8 follicles on the left side. When we add the two numbers together, we're looking for at least two of them whose measurements added together equal 36 or greater, followed by a couple that are close. That will tell us that you probably have mature or soon to be mature eggs in there, and it's time to order your trigger shot, okay? Now the trigger shot is a little shot in the belly. Some of you may need to do one that is with a long needle in the, the backside, but that will be kind of a last minute decision by your doctor, and it depends on how your cycle went throughout that. All right? So let's pretend this is Thursday. It's, I'm going to call Mary. Mary, your estradiol today is 2,500. You have all these wonderful follicles on the right side, your two biggest, 20 by 20, 19 by 18, and some smaller ones. On the left side, 19 by 19 is ready, and you've got some others that are close. So we're going to stop the Lupron, the Cetratide, Ganarelix, Menopure, Repronex, Folistim, Gonalef, whatever combination we've had you on, you took your last dose this morning and there will be no more. Embryology assigns the time that you are to take the trigger shot. It's not a random disposition of who gets what time. It depends on a lot of factors. If you're going to have intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where the lab actually has to look for good, normal sperm and inject it directly into each of your eggs, it takes them longer to do that. So you might be an earlier case. If you have diabetes and you can't be without food or fluid very long, you will be an earlier case in the morning. So let's say Mary gets assigned 8.30 tonight to do her shot. I will remind you how that's done. And that is, of everything that we do, the most important one to be exactly on time. Okay? Your other medicines that you're giving, if you do it 7 o'clock one night and 7.30 the next and 6.15 the next, that's okay, but this is the one that must be on time because you have other people after you that become a domino effect. If you're late, they're late, the next one's later, and et cetera. So please make sure that you are exactly on time. Now here's the bad news. Sometimes you're going to get assigned a middle-of-the-night trigger shot. It's happened a lot this week because there are so many of you having your retrievals on the same day. My suggestion to you is do not stay up for it. You're going to think, I'll read, I'll watch TV, you'll be asleep in the chair in no time. We're an exhausted society all the time. So go to bed at your normal time, set a whole bunch of clocks, your cell phones on either side, some of them a little further away from your bed, so when they go off, you have to get out of the bed to shut them off, and when your feet are on the floor, you can get your medicine, give it, and pop back right into bed. Okay? But don't try and stay up for it. If your trigger shot's at 8.30 tonight, your retrieval is in 36 hours. So that would be, today's Thursday, Saturday at 8.30 in the morning. I'm going to give you some other instructions, such as, there's no testing tomorrow. There are no shots tomorrow. 
you're going to have anesthesia for your procedure. It does not necessarily entail a tube in your throat. It's really going to be some medicine that they put in your IV. So because there's questions that they need to ask you and verify who you are and put your IV in, we have you come an hour before your procedure is scheduled so all of that can take place. And also, sometime during your cycle, we'll have you meet with the anesthesia doctors for a pre-op to go over if you've had anesthesia in the past and you had a bad experience with some of the medicines. If you have any major medical issues, diabetes, kidney transplant, heart problems, anything that might cause excessive bleeding, we will have you meet with anesthesia before you even begin your cycle because sometimes it takes us a while to get your records from your primary care doctor or whoever the doctor is who's caring for you for that particular problem. If you are healthy, normal, just on the medicines that we give you, you can do that anesthesia pre-op on one of the days that you come for testing. All right? So nothing to eat or drink from midnight the night before your procedure. This is the tower building. That's where all the patient rooms are and our procedure operating room. It's built like a clover leaf with pods A, B, C, and D. And you'll go to the fifth floor C pod to have your retrieval and your transfer. 5C. All right? Now, also in this phone call, to Mary, I'm going to say, Mary, when did John have an ejaculation last? Because we want to make sure that we have good, new, healthy sperm there that we're going to use on the day of the retrieval. So if it's been a while, we're going to suggest that John has an ejaculation the night of your trigger shot, but it has to be, if he's doing it with you, before the trigger shot is given or any time that evening if it's by himself. So kind of when you're in cycle and you're somewhere along day nine or 10, that might be a good time to have an ejaculation and get ready, okay? You both have to bring your blue hospital cards with you. Males need a picture ID. If you forget to bring something like that with you when you bring her to the retrieval, we're actually going to send you home to get it. We will not put sperm in with eggs until we've positively identified you. So there are no possible mix-ups at all. So make sure you have your driver's license with you. If you're from out of the country, a passport. It's also when they give anesthesia while we're anticipating everything will go fine and your anesthesia will be in your IV. As with anything in medicine, I need to tell you that there could be unforeseen complications. You could possibly need to have a tube put in your throat for an airway. You will always have an anesthesiologist right with you at every moment. And if that happens, if you've got any pierced facial body parts, nose, lip, <coughs> tongue, you need to take those out and not have them with you. It's a fragrance-free area as everywhere in the hospital. Deodorant is fine, nothing else. No jewelry, R wedding rings can stay on. A anything else dangling, leave home. Bracelets, necklace, earrings. Uh, no fingernail polish, because they're going to put an oxygen meter on you that can't read through dark fingernail polish. Toe polish is fine. And basically what they do, they put your IV in, they ask you lots of questions, they walk you to the operating room so you can get up on the table and make yourself comfortable, make sure your back is okay, and when everything is fine, you give them the high sign, and then they will put you to sleep. The procedure itself is about 15 minutes, so it's very brief. And then they'll put something in your IV to wake you right up. You'll be a little groggy. You'll go back to the recovery room. Um, if your belly is sore, oh, by the way, how do they do this? How do we get the eggs out of you, right? We used to have some great posters, but they got damaged by some water. So. 
through the side wall of your vagina, they will put a needle, this is not to scale, into the follicle and collect the fluid into a tube very much like when you have blood drawn. So a big long tube that goes into the glass tube. And they'll do this with every one of your follicles that they can get into. The little tiny ones they may not be able to, so they'll avoid those. But the bigger ones they will. So what you're having here are lots of pokes and sticks in your vagina. It bleeds a little bit later on. So you'll have a pad on. Anytime we manipulate stuff with your ovaries, everything down there gets uncomfortable. They'll give you some pain medicine, and you'll be able to go home with a prescription for pain medicine, which is usually Percocet. If you've had that before and it kind of made your stomach upset, you can tell them and they'll order something different. Not everybody needs to take that, but if you do, it's perfectly fine. They will introduce the sperm and put them into, put the dishes into the incubator, and then overnight they'll do their thing. And the next day, the embryologist will take them out to look at how many of your eggs sperm got into. That's called fertilization. And again, roughly 50%. So if you have more than that, it's a great day. We will call you about noontime or so to let you know how many fertilized. And at that point, it will be determined whether you'll have your transfer on day three or possibly day five. There's a criteria that you need to meet. You have to be under a certain age. You have to have a certain number of embryos. So if you are a day three versus day five transfer, then you will be given a time for the day three, and you have to be ready to arrive. But that morning, they will look at your embryos, and if they're growing beautifully and doing really well, and the embryologists feel that they can wait two more days until their blastocysts, They'll call you up and say, don't come in today. We're going to do you on day five instead. So it's a little inconvenient. You have to be sort of ready for two possible days of a transfer. If they're marginally growing, they might want them in you sooner, so you'll come in for the day three. All right? Has anybody had an intrauterine insemination here before? Nobody? IUI. IUI. Okay, so an IUI is similar to that catheter that was used for your mock transfer, which is similar to the catheter we use for the transfer of your embryos. So you're back in the same operating room. This time you don't need anesthesia, you're awake. The catheter speculum goes in, the catheter goes through your cervix. Now they've put the embryos in the syringe and they're going to put that catheter to the top part of your uterus, squirt the embryos in, take the catheter out, you have to stay there and they're going to run over to the embryology lab which is right a room right off the operating room and they'll look at the catheter under the microscope. Remember we can't see eggs by our naked eye. So we want to make sure that they all pass through the catheter into you. So they will check the catheter first before letting you out of the room. You put your legs down, you transfer to a Barco lounger. Actually, you walk back into the recovery area and sit in a Barco lounger for about 15 minutes. You don't need to be upside down. You don't need to go to bed for three days. You can do your normal activity there are some restrictions. Nothing in your vagina for a week. And I would suggest since embryos free float around for a while, 15, 18 hours, we don't know exactly the point at which they're going to try to implant. Just take it easy. If you have the opportunity to take an elevator instead of stairs, do that for a few days. I wouldn't suggest you go to the gym. Embryos don't like internal heat. So if you can just stay nice and calm and easy, you can go back to work. If you're 
doing some kind of job that involves a lot of physical activity, you might want to make arrangements just to back that down. If you sit at a desk and then you get up and you have to do various things, that's fine. And if you stand like five hours standing? That's fine. Okay? You're not standing five hours and jumping up and down. So if you're just standing, it's totally fine. They won't fall out. Okay? So, the hard part is going to be from your retrieval and transfer to the time you have your pregnancy test, which is 16 days after your retrieval. If that falls on a weekend, we try to do it. If Friday's closer, we'll have you in on Friday. If Monday is closer, we'll wait until Monday. It's a hard time for you because up until that point, you've been, your car has been programmed to go to the Brigham a lot to do testing. You've gotten phone calls from us a lot. And now all of a sudden, your procedures are done. There are no more phone calls. There's no more coming to the Brigham. You're doing some sort of progesterone uh, medication at home. You're you might be taking some pills for estrogen. And all of that hubbub and excitement that you did earlier has now stopped. The trigger shot that you gave yourself is going to make you feel pregnant. It's the hormone of pregnancy. So it may make you a little nauseous, may make your breasts feel enlarged and sore. You're going to feel your belly big because we've made big ovaries when we gave you the stimulation medicine. I'd like to please implore you, beg you, don't do a home pregnancy test. First of all, it drives you crazy. Secondly, it may not be accurate. And please don't assume if you begin bleeding that you're not pregnant and don't stop your medicines. Call us. We might bring you in earlier for your test. We might ascertain that your bleeding is just when you wipe and we'll just leave it alone and wait a little longer. Bleeding doesn't always mean the cycle failed. We have lots of patients who are pregnant and bleeding a little. There is no 100% guarantee in IVF that you will become pregnant on this cycle. But our statistics are pretty good better than the alternative, okay? So we'll, we'll see what happens. If you are pregnant on that day, we have you come for your blood test. What we're checking for is a number, not just a yes or no, which is why we don't want you to do a home test. That's the yes or no variety. But the blood test gives us a number, and we can see if it's high or if it's really low, if it's a problem. We will repeat it in two days. We're looking for a 66% rise every two days. And we'll repeat it one more time if it's doing the rising as it should. And then we will schedule you for an ultrasound when you're somewhere between seven and eight weeks pregnant. You'll see the doctor. And then if everything's going well, we'll send you off to your own OB doctor. And if you don't have one, we'll help to recommend somebody for you. If you are not pregnant, if the test is a negative test, you will stop your medicines. You will have um, a period probably within about two weeks after stopping the medicines. Our doctors and embryologists meet every Wednesday afternoon to review your cycle. We will reapply to your insurance at that time. And we need to give you at least a month to have your ovaries calm down and go back to their normal little size before we start up another cycle. So we don't do back-to-back -back IVF because your ovaries would be very unhappy. We'll let them calm down, quiet, and then do it again. And we may change your protocol at that point. We'd also like you to meet with your doctor afterwards so they can go over any um, news about what happened with your embryos or any explanation if they have any on why it didn't work and then we'll try again. When you ovulate by yourself from these follicles 
and the fluid goes out and the egg goes out, goes up into your tube, this follicle changes its role and it begins to make a lot of progesterone to make a very thick lining and a happy place for an implantation. But in IVF, you're not ovulating. We're taking your eggs out. So we think that those follicles don't do all that they're supposed to because they're a little confused. So everybody ta doing IVF needs to take some sort of progesterone preparation. And if you're pregnant, that will continue until about 10 weeks, at which time the placenta is big enough and now it's making those hormones for you and you don't need the extra stuff. Did Barbara talk to you about the progesterone uh, types of uh, preparation there are? Okay, three types. The gold standard we've used forever is a big needle injection in your butt of progesterone in oil once a day in the evening usually. All right, big needle, not a great thing. However, I want to preface, the other two preparations are not great either. So while you need to have some sort of progesterone, none of them are wonderful. A second choice is progesterone suppositories. They're made into a thing that looks like a wax bullet with a rounded end and a flat end. And you're going to push that into your vagina, one of them, three times a day. The third choice is crinone gel. So progesterone can't be delivered all by itself. It has to be attached to something. So we have oil, we have wax bullet, we have gel. So the downside to the injections is a big injection, but once a day. The downside to the vaginal preparations is that whatever we put in there is going to melt and come out. So it keeps you a little bit wet and irritated. Uh, probably I would suggest you wear a panty liner because otherwise you'll wreck all your underwear. They're all equally effective. We would not offer them to you as a choice if we thought that one was not as good as, an, as a different one. I will tell you in the frozen transfer cycles, where we're doing medicines a lot differently, we do not use crinone, because we have found that that's not as effective in a frozen cycle. All right, so some doctors prefer one over the other. My patients, I let you have the choice. If you're somebody who's prone to yeast infections, you may want to start out with the injections. And if you're pregnant, you can switch over to something else afterwards. We can't do a lot of switching back and forth with it because it doesn't, it's not as effective when you do that. If you decide that you want to do the injections, but your partner is not home every night, and he's the one who's helping you with it because it's back behind you, that might not be a good choice. You might want to do a vaginal one instead. Did all of you get consent forms, a booklet of consent forms from your physicians at some point when you were here? We need both partners to sign that. If you have them with you and they don't have your name in the upper right-hand corner, you may have stickers in your booklet, and if you could just tear off a sticker and put them on the top copy of each one of them, and you can tear off the yellow bottom copy, and that is yours. Let me talk to you a minute about freezing, all right? Freezing embryos after your transfer. This is not a matter of math. Okay, I have 10 embryos. And they're going to put two back in, which means there are eight left over, so whoop, they should go right in the freezer. That's not how it works. The best of the best are going to go into you. The next best category is going to be watched to see if they are suitable for freezing. They may not be. They have to be able to survive a very rapid freeze and then they have to be able to survive a thaw sometime later when you're going to use them. And the embryologists know which ones are good and which ones are not so good. So not everybody will have embryos suitable for freezing. But if you would like to go that route, you do need to sign the freezing consent up front in anticipation of possibly being able to do that. Okay? 
There is also a long-term contract. It's about 10 pages clipped together with a stapler. And that is for New England Cryogenics Center. We don't have a lot of storage space for uh, frozen embryos. They have to be in these great big giant tanks. And we don't have a lot of room for that. But we are going to keep them here on site for three years with the hopes that you might use them before the three-year time period. If you don't, then at three years, they're going to go on a little road trip down to Newton to be stored at New England Cryogenics Center, where they have a much larger space than we do. Oftentimes, and I don't know your specific insurance company, but often the insurance will cover the first year of freezing, and then you're responsible for each year thereafter and you will get built. What do you do with the frozen embryos that you have? So your insurance company might require you to use them before you do another fresh cycle. If you only have one embryo frozen, they probably won't. But if you have multiple ones, they might require you to use them. The frozen cycle, much easier. You get your period, you come in the next day for some blood tests, no ultrasound. We start oral estrogen pills. A couple days later, we'll check your level to make sure we have you on enough pills. And then we don't see you until day 14 of your cycle, where you'll have a blood and an ultrasound. And the ultrasound is to see how thick the lining has gotten from the pills. If it's thick enough, we'll start progesterone. And if you have day three frozen embryos, three days later, they'll thaw and transfer. If you have day five frozen embryos, five days later after you start progesterone, they will thaw and transfer. It's a one cycle, about three weeks, hardly any medicine and hardly any testing. It's much easier. Now, the theory is that any tissue that's frozen, so frozen sperm, frozen embryos, frozen eggs, do not yield as high a pregnancy rate. In fact, I think it's great. The frozen transfer, sometimes you might not get pregnant on the fresh one, but you had really good embryos and they could freeze them, and you come back on the frozen one and you're pregnant with that one. Go figure. So I think they do very well. So there are some that are not growing. They've arrested in their development. They can't be frozen. They can't be put back into you. Um, but we can talk about that. Guys, if you don't have a Brigham Hospital number yet, please get one. It's imperative that we have you. Uh, you're, you already have a number. You may not have a card, but you have a hospital number. If you don't have a card, do you need to get one? Do you know what? The hospital's phasing out blue cards. As long as you have a number. They're going to these stickers, yeah, they're going over. It happened that the blue cards, when they went through the stamper machine, first of all, the company that makes those stamper machines is out of business. So we have some old ones, and when they malfunction, we can't get them fixed or replaced. Also, the stamper machine stamped blue, and after time, that blue ink fades away, so you can't see your name or your number. So the more permanent one is a black and white sticker, and that's what we're going to. I don't care if you actually have the blue card. I care that you have your number, and you've been registered. How do I, where do I get my number? I have your number. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. How are we going to get the medicine? Oh, how are we going to get the medicines? Very good question. I assume Barbara told you that. We're going to order them for you. If you know that your insurance requires you to use Medco, Caremark, CuraScript, Aetna, Teldrug, please tell us. If you have no clue where your medicines come from, we're going to order them from an infertility specialist pharmacy. We have two of them in Massachusetts. We're lucky for that. Uh, there's one in Texas as well, Walgreens Specialty Pharmacy. And we will go through those pharmacies because your regular CVS on the corner, not only do they not keep this medicine in stock, they actually don't even know what it's used for or how to order it or how to dispense it. So. 
We'll take care of that. What happens is when class is over, your nurses are going to start working on that this afternoon. Okay? If it turns out that when we put your order into, let's say, Village Pharmacy in Waltham, they have somebody who runs your insurance, and if it needs to be from somewhere else, they'll call us, and then we'll transfer your prescriptions over. You will have refills on everything. We are only allowed to order 10 days of medicine at a time. You will probably need more than that while you're in cycle. Do not run out. The callback sheet that I get with a little note on the bottom that says, I have no more gonalef. I'm dying here because it's hard to get it to you that very same day. So when you use your last pen, when you open up your last gonalef pen, consult with us so we can tell you how much more you might need. Okay? I, I like the notes on the bottom of the callback sheets that say, I have three doses of gonalef pen left. How much do I need? Or I have four bottles of Menopure left. It gives us time to reorder for you. All right, now I'm going to give you a quick little thing. I'm looking at the clock because usually Annie Gagan comes in at this time. She must be with a patient. She's one of our social workers. We have two in our department, Laura and Annie. They work with our patients because this is a very stressful process. It's not something that any of you would have wished on yourselves. It's intensive time intensive, it's going to ruin your jobs because you have to be here instead of where you need to be, and it's anxiety provoking. And it's difficult for you when you go places, you're visiting a friend who's just had a baby, and you want one too. So here's the deal, you don't have to go if you don't feel that you can tolerate it. Or you have a, a sign with your partner I'm going to go for five minutes, I'm going to say hello, and then we're going to leave. Or you say, let's, let's do a little, you know, we do a wink. My husband and I have one of these. We're out of here. Okay? When you need to leave, get a sign with your partner and walk out the door if it's too uncomfortable. You can explain to your friends if, you, if they know what you're doing that you'll be back with them. You're not abandoning them, but it's just too hard. And if you don't want to tell anybody, then keep it private, but have a setup to keep it comfortable for you. When your mother-in-law calls at night, every night, so she's here living with you. So how did it go? How were your tests today? How was your ultrasound? What's going on? What did they say? Blah, blah, blah. Give the phone to her son. You deal with it. Filter everything. And guys, She's going to be emotional. These are major hormones. She's going to laugh when you think, like, what is she laughing at? Or cry when she maybe shouldn't be. You can't fix it. You can't make it better. Just be supportive. Don't try to drill her for what's wrong, what can I do, how can I help. Just kind of stay out of her way a little bit. Try and just be as emotionally helpful as you can. It's tough. It's about... 10 to 12 days of brutal stuff, and then you'll be yourselves again afterwards. Um, so Annie and Laura will see any of you if you need some help, you need somebody to talk to. She'll see the females, she'll see the males alone, or couples together if you're having a tough time getting through this, or you just need somebody to bounce this off. If this has been a long, long road for you, it might be helpful to to group with a, a social worker on a regular basis just to have somebody to give you the breathing exercises and how you can make it through this. Okay? All right.